So first we're going to discuss what carbohydrates are and their general functions. So carbohydrates are a very common organic compound that are composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms. Carbohydrates, or carbs, serve as the body's major source of energy via glucose and also comprise the structure of cell membranes within the body. So carbohydrates are classified by the number of carbon atoms present within the chain, the length of the chain of carbons, and the location of the carbonyl group. So when I say carbonyl group, this is where the carbon atom is double bonded to the oxygen atom. So we're going to talk about three classifications of carbohydrates within this lecture, monosaccharides, oligosaccharides, and polysaccharides. So the first classification we're going to talk about are the monosaccharides, which are the building block simple sugars, uh, which are classified based on the number of carbons that are present in their chains. So for example, trioses uh, have three carbon atoms, tetroses have four carbon atoms, pentoses have five carbon atoms, and hexoses have six carbon atoms. From a clinical laboratory perspective, the most significant monosaccharides are the pentoses and the hexoses. Significant pentoses include ribose and deoxyribose, which are components of RNA and DNA, respectively. Significant hexoses are glucose, fructose, and galactose. The primary role uh, for the glucose molecule is to act as a source of energy. Fructose molecules act as an alternative metabolite in providing energy, especially when glucose uh, molecules are not available for the body to use. Galactose is also a molecule that provides energy to the body as well. So the picture on the right hand side of the slide uh, here shows the molecules uh, glucose, fructose, galactose, and then of course ribose and deoxyribose. So just as an FYI, this is only for reference. So as MLTs and MLSs, uh, you do not need to memorize the structures or produce them on any type of board or exam. Just there for reference. Disaccharides are carbohydrates that are formed by the bonding of two monosaccharides. The most common are sucrose, lactose, and maltose, which I have listed here. So sucrose is produced naturally in plants from which white sugar is refined and crystallized. Lactose is a sugar that is found naturally in milk and milk uh, products like cheese or ice cream. And maltose is a sugar that is in plant seeds uh, that plants break down in order to sprout. So foods like cereal have a lot of maltose in them. So in order for our body to properly absorb these disaccharides, they must be broken down or hydrolyzed by enzymes within the body. So sucrose uh, the, is the disaccharide is broken down into glucose and fructose. And remember those glucose, that glucose and fructose are monosaccharides. Um, and so that's broken down into those two monosaccharides when hydrolyzed by the enzyme sucrase. Lactose is broken down into the two monosaccharides, glucose and galactose, when hydrolyzed or broken down by the enzyme lactase. Uh, when hydrolyzed by maltase, maltose breaks down into two glucose molecules. Uh, so again, uh, like in this previous uh, slide, the picture on the right-hand side uh, shows the molecules lactose, maltose, and sucrose. Um, so these are only for your reference. You do not, as, as an MLT and an MLS student, you do not need to memorize these structures or produce them on any boards or anything um, like that. Um, and just as a note, um, I'm sure you all uh, have had chemistry already before, um, but just as reference, anything with ACE, so A-S-E, like sucrase, lactase, maltase, that means it's an enzyme. Um, and generally the ACE is on the, uh, the root word. So like for example, maltase. So maltase is an enzyme that breaks down maltose. Hopefully that helps. Oligosaccharides are a type of carbohydrate form when there are three to 10 simple sugars linked together. And polysaccharides are carbohydrates that are formed from 10 or more monosaccharides bonded together. Examples of polysaccharides are starch, glycogen, and cellulose. So starch is a primary carbohydrate in diets and is broken down or digested by the enzyme amylase. So again, that ASE is, a, an, is an enzyme. Plants store glucose in the form of starch. Glycogen is the storage form of glucose in the liver and skeletal muscle of animals. 
And animals can use this glycogen as a short-term energy reserve. So um, if, they're, if they're not able to access glucose through their diet, um, the body can use that glycogen uh, stored in the liver and the skeletal muscle uh, to, um, as, as energy reserves. Now, cellulose is unable to be digested by humans because of the lack of the enzyme cellulase. So if humans don't have this, therefore they can't break that cellulose uh, molecule down. So cellulose comprises the cell wall of plants. Um, so just as a, as a mental note here, students tend to get, from my experience, starch versus cellulose confused on exams and quizzes. So starch is the storage form of glucose in plants, whereas cellulose is in plant cell wall. So don't just associate each of these words with the word plant. So know the exact difference between the two. So I found that students, anytime they see plant, they immediately go to cellulose when actually uh, the answer could be starch, like on an exam or quiz. So definitely know the difference between those. Don't, don't just word associate. So in general, glucose levels are kept relatively steady, even during eating and fasting. Um, so the body is able to regulate these levels uh, via the collaborative, um, a collaboration of various hormones. So the main one is a hormone called insulin. And insulin is, a, is a, a, of course, a, a hormone that is produced in the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans of the pancreas. So when released, the insulin is detected and bound by insulin receptors on cell membranes. And this binding causes glucose to travel into the cells and therefore reducing the level of glucose in the bloodstream. So when these receptors are absent or non-functional, they are unable to react with the insulin and the glucose cannot enter the cell. So this causes an elevation of glucose levels. And here on this next slide, I've kind of um, created a picture uh, to, to show you kind of uh, how this works. All right, so this looks here. So this is something that I created. All right, so this is inside of a blood vessel. And let me get my pointer here. I'll use black today. So this is inside of uh, a blood vessel. And here would be the serum or the plasma. And then these large red things here are red blood cells, okay? So all of this is hanging out in the blood vessel. So over here on the right-hand side, I have a little chart here um, to show you kind of what these are. So uh, the, what these are. Um, so this little yellow box are the insulin receptors. And if you notice, they're on the surface of the red blood cell, okay? So those are insulin receptors. Um, so they're on all the red cells. They do, I'm just using this picture as an example. And then the I stands for insulin. So for example, this one here is I. So insulin is just hanging out in, in the plasma and um, these insulin receptors are hanging out on the red blood cell surface. And then we have this kind of purplish, bluish colored circle and that's gonna be uh, representing glucose. So this here is a glucose molecule. So what happens here? So somebody ingests glucose um, through eating, right? And glucose goes into the bloodstream for use, okay? And what happens is insulin that is released from the pancreas goes and binds with the insulin receptor. It reacts with the insulin receptor, all right? And what happens then, once this interaction occurs between the insulin and the insulin receptor, this glucose or these glucose molecules say, oh, okay, cool. We're going to go into the red blood cell. Okay. So this one will go too. That's right. right. Okay. So that's how it works. Right. So insulin reacts with the insulin receptor on the surface of the red blood cell, and that sucks in the glucose molecules from the, the plasma into the red blood cell for use. Now, how does this affect um, how does this affect blood values? So, um, if you think about it here, um, let's say for example there are no insulin receptors. Okay, so all these go away. No insulin receptors at all. Can I erase? I think I can. Yeah. Okay. Good. Let's erase these. 
So all of those insulin receptors are just going to go away or let's just say they don't work. So they're either not there or they don't work. What's gonna happen? We have the insulin, right? But it, it has nothing to react with. So that means all the glucose that the body is ingesting is just going to multiply. It's just gonna continue to add up because it's not ever going to go into the red blood cell. Okay, so this causes somebody to have high blood glucose or high blood sugar. Um, and we'll talk about here in a little bit that this is this is diabetes mellitus, either type one or type two, depending on what the, the actual issue is. But a lot of times uh, students I found get confused why insulin is a hormone that lowers blood glucose. And the reason for this is, you know, let's let's erase all this again. <laughs> okay, so insulin lowers blood glucose. And the reason for that is here's insulin, here's that receptor, it's going to react with it, and it's going to pull in that glucose into the red blood cell, all right? So when we test a patient for blood glucose levels, what we are doing is we're taking all of this blood, Okay, and we are putting this blood into a centrifuge, right? And we are testing all of this white stuff here. Okay, we're not testing the red blood cells. We're testing the plasma okay, for glucose molecules. We're not testing glucose in this red blood cell. We're testing it in the plasma, okay? So, that is why it lowers blood glucose. Insulin lowers blood glucose is if we're testing all of, all of this stuff on the outside of the red blood cell, the insulin causes this red blood cell to go, or I'm sorry, causes this glucose molecule to go into the red blood cell and therefore there's going to be less of it to be tested, right? So that's why it's going to be lowered blood glucose levels. Okay, so let's now talk about the metabolism or breakdown of glucose. So when somebody consumes carbohydrates, uh, those carbohydrates are initially converted to disaccharides. Uh, via their specific enzymes, these disaccharides are then broken down into monosaccharides. Uh, so these are then absorbed by the intestines and are transported to the In addition to insulin, there are also counter-regulatory hormones that help maintain a steady state of glucose within the body. So these counter-regulatory hormones include glucagon, cortisol, epinephrine, growth hormone, and thyroid hormones T3 and T4. So glucagon is produced in the alpha cells of the islet de Langerhans of the pancreas, and it functions by increasing blood glucose uh, via stimulating um, an increase of glycogenolysis. Cortisol is produced and secreted by the adrenal cortex. It also increases blood glucose levels um, by increasing gluconeogenesis. Epine epinephrine uh, is produced by the adrenal medulla and increases glycogenolysis, uh, thereby increasing blood glucose levels. And like epinephrine, thyroid hormones, uh, triiodothyronine, which is T3, and thyroxine, which is T4, also increase blood glucose levels by increasing glycogenolysis. The anterior uh, pituitary uh, gland produces growth hormone and increases blood glucose levels by inhibiting insulin in the body. So all of these hormones increase blood glucose levels. Insulin is the only hormone that actually lowers blood glucose levels. So you start to notice as we go through the clinical chemistry lecture series uh, that we'll talk about the physiology of a certain analyte in the body, what it does, how it functions, and then we'll move on to how we test for that analyte and what the normal ranges are for it. So when I say a reference range or a normal range, I mean the range that is given to a test based on the results that are seen in 95% of the healthy population. So we very commonly test for glucose in patients. The normal fasting glucose in serum or plasma is 70 to 100 milligrams per deciliter. And we'll talk about that test here in a moment. 
Fasting whole blood, uh, so this is whole blood from a finger stick, so this is blood that's not centrifuged. Um, it's around 11 to 15% lower than the value that the serum or plasma glucose would be. The glucose concentration in the water that makes up plasma is equal to that of erythrocytes or red blood cells. And plasma has greater, uh, a greater water content than red blood cells and therefore exhibits higher glucose levels than whole blood. In addition to serum or plasma and whole blood glucose testing, we can also test glucose levels in uh, cerebral spinal fluid or CSF. Uh, and normal glucose levels for a cerebral spinal fluid specimen um, are, for, are from 40 to uh, 70 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, the, the glucose renal threshold is 180 milligrams per deciliters. So what this means is that the glucose level in the blood can be under 180 milligrams per deciliter before the kidneys can no longer uh, filter it and then glucose shows up in the urine. Um, so you've already taken uh, the urinalysis course if you're in this uh, CLT or MLT program. Um, but um, if you haven't uh, taken that, um, there are urine dipsticks, um, and urine dipsticks have a glucose pad on it. Um, so the glucose pad will be positive after the level of glucose is greater than 180 milligrams per deciliter in the bloodstream. Um, and just as a side note, I always get asked about reference ranges. You know, are these going to be on the exam? Are these going to be, you know, or am I going to be quizzed on this? You know, you have to know these reference ranges uh, for the class that I'm teaching, um, also for your board, uh, also for your clinical rotations, and for when you graduate and start working in a lab. So yes, you need to know reference ranges uh, for every analyte that we're going to be talking about in clinical chemistry. Sorry, but it's just what needs to happen. You need to know them. So currently the most commonly preferred screening test for glucose is the fasting blood glucose, or FBS, or the fasting plasma glucose, or FPG test. The patient fasts for a certain number of hours, then has their blood glucose measured. A normal FBS or FPG test uh, result is a glucose below 100 milligrams per deciliter. So if a patient has a result of 126 milligram uh, per deciliter of glucose or higher, um, there, this is consistent with the diagnosis of diabetes mellitus. And we'll talk about that here momentarily. A patient can also have a two, uh, two hour postprandial glucose test uh, so in this test, the patient eats a meal with a certain number of carbohydrates in it and then has their blood glucose tested two hours later. Uh, the carbohydrate meal can also be replaced with a glucose drink. Um, for these tests, a glucose level of greater than 200 milligrams per deciliter is indicative of diabetes mellitus, which again, we'll talk about here momentarily. Um, an oral glucose tolerance test is also available. Um, and this test is commonly performed for the diagnosis of gestational diabetes, which again, we will talk about here in a little bit. Uh, after the patient has fasted for a certain number of hours for this test, an initial baseline glucose um, is uh, drawn. Uh, the patient is then given a drink uh, containing a certain number of carbohydrates. Their blood glucose level is then drawn at various intervals after the consumption of the drink. So for example, 30 minutes after the drink, one hour after the drink, et cetera. So in hospitals or other inpatient settings, uh, point of care glucose levels can be taken with whole blood via finger stick puncture. Uh, it's important to note that whole blood glucose levels will be around 11 to 15% lower than the glucose result of those that are tested on serum or plasma. So this picture on the right hand side shows um, a 50 gram um, drink of dextrose. So this is um, given uh, for the oral glucose tolerance test. Typically for fasting glucose uh, testing, the patient is recommended to fast for 10 to 12 hours prior to the collection of their sample. So this means uh, no food and clear liquids, um, sorry, no food and just drinking clear liquids for that 10 to 12 hour period. Um, so a red, green, or gold specimen tube is acceptable. Uh, it's 
really important to note that for glucose testing, the specimen must be spun in a centrifuge as soon as possible. And the reason for this is if the serum or the plasma is left to sit unspun, so meaning the, the serum or the plasma is just mixed in with the red blood cells, it's not centrifuged yet, those red blood cells uh, will utilize around 5% of the glucose that's in that sample per hour. Uh, and so this will result in a falsely decreased glucose value, so wrong results for that patient. So if it's known that the specimen cannot be immediately spun down, so like an example, um, like if the patient is in a nursing home um, that gets sent to, the, the blood work gets sent to an off-site laboratory and they don't have a centrifuge available, or if like a home healthcare setting where a phlebotomist is visiting a patient um, and they don't have a centrifuge readily available to them, uh, that could be an example of that. And if they don't have that, uh, the ability to immediately spin that sample, uh, they can draw the um, this patient's blood in a gray top tube. So the additive in that is sodium fluoride. Um, and so this sodium fluoride actually inhibits glycolysis and it will not affect the glucose value. So you now should understand what glucose is what hormones regulate glucose, and what tests are performed to determine a patient's glucose level within their body. So as a clinical laboratory technologist or medical laboratory technologist, it's important to understand how the values of glucose, te glucose tests are determined in the laboratory. So glucose hexokinase is the most spe specific reaction for glucose and therefore the reference method for glucose testing. So you'll hear the term reference method come up a lot in clinical chemistry. And what this means is, is that the, this is the method by which the performance of an alternate um, method is measured or evaluated. So in this uh, testing procedure, the hexokinase enzyme is combined with the patient's sample, which contains glucose in it, obviously, and it catalyzes a series of reactions that produce NADH as one of its end products. And the amount of NADH is proportional to the amount of glucose in the sample. The glucose is quantified by an increase of absorption of absorbance at 340 nanometers, and this is a spectrophotometer. Um, so it used to be that clinical laboratory technologists or medical laboratory technologists would manually perform this procedure and then measure the absorbance, absorbance at that 340 nanometers using a spectrophotometer. But nowadays, you don't, the, most labs don't do this um, manually. Um, one of those big uh, chemistry analyzers performs the reaction for us. The Trinder reaction or glucose oxidase test is another method that laboratories can use to determine the amount of glucose in a patient's sample. Um, so the enzyme glucose oxidase helps to catalyze the oxidation of glucose in a sample uh, to hydrogen peroxide and gluconic acid. And the amount of glucose in a patient's sample is proportional to the amount of O2 that is consumed during the reaction. Um, so again, this used to be something that um, medical laboratory professionals would perform um, manually, uh, kind of like the glucose hexokinase test, um, but this is something that most labs, um, at least in the United States, do not do anymore, you know, manually. It's done on a, a, a large chemistry analyzer. The clinitest is a copper reduction reaction that is used for the detection of galactose in urine. So the clinitest is uh, described as a semi-quantitative test in the laboratory. Um, and so when I say semi-quantitative, I mean that this is, uh, this means that an exact number value is not given for the level of galactose. However, the level can be approximated via a color change. Um, so when I say uh, in, within this, uh, the realms of clinical chemistry, there are qualitative and quantitative tests. And so qualitative tests would be, uh, an example of that would be a pregnancy test, right? So it gives you a positive or negative result, um, like an at-home pregnancy test. That's a qualitative it just says, yes, you're pregnant. No, you're not pregnant. It doesn't tell you how pregnant you are. Okay, so that's a qualitative test. And a quantitative test um, would be, so let's say, for example, a pregnancy test. So if they actually test the blood uh, for something called beta, beta HCG, 
uh, which is uh, a pregnancy hormone, um, it will give you an exact amount of how much of that hormone is present. And that can tell the physician uh, how far along the patient is within their pregnancy. So that is a quantitative test. So this clinic test, of course, this has nothing to do with pregnancy, but this clinic test is something we call semi-quantitative, meaning it doesn't tell you yes or no um, galactose is present. I mean, it does tell you that, but it also gives you a range based upon a color change. So it doesn't give you an exact number, but it can give you a range based on that, that color change. So that's uh, what we mean by semi-quantitative. Uh, so when the urine reacts with a clinitest tablet, it produces varying colors. So blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. A blue color means that the test is negative for the presence of galactose, while the other colors indicate that certain percentage or uh, the range of galactose present. Um, so I have a video um, on my channel of me actually performing a clinic test for you. And I will go ahead and link that uh, below um, in the comments section or maybe in the about the video so that way you have access to it. I recommend you checking out that out. Um, again, it's a step-by-step -step procedure of me performing that clinic test. So I've said diabetes mellitus a couple times within this lecture. Um, so diabetes mellitus is a very common disease uh, within the United States. Uh, it's estimated currently at the time of this video recording uh, to affect around 9% of Americans. Uh, so this disease is characterized by an issue with insulin, uh, which is, uh, ends up leading to hyperglycemia. Uh, and hyperglycemia as a term means an increased glucose level within the blood. Um, so other symptoms of diabetes mellitus other than that um, hyperglycemia are increased thirst, irritability, uh, change in weight, and polyuria, which is an increase in urine output. So there's two different main types of diabetes mellitus, type 1 and type 2. Uh, so type 1 diabetes mellitus uh, is also referred to as insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. Uh, it's often referred to as juvenile diabetes because the age of onset is usually less than 20 years of age. So now recall that insulin is produced in the beta cells of the pancreas. Uh, so type 1 diabetes is caused by an insulin deficiency due to a damage of those beta cells. So this type of diabetes mellitus uh, requires the patient to receive insulin replacement um, and um, control their diet. So type 1 diabetics uh, can um, also have increased lipids or fat in their blood, experience kidney disease, microvascular damage, hypertension, which is an increase of blood pressure, and ketoacidosis. So microvascular damage um, is to the small blood vessels within the body and can lead to things like retinopathy, which is a disease of the retina in the eye, and neuropathy, which is a damage to the peripheral nerves in the body. Uh, hypertension, of course, like I said, is high blood pressure, and ketoacidosis is when the body produces high levels of blood acids called ketones. Uh, we'll discuss ketones further on in this lecture. So type 2 diabetes mellitus is also referred to as non-insulin dependent diabetes, and this usually occurs in patients after 40 years of age. So this is actually the most common form of diabetes mellitus and it's caused by a deficiency of those insulin receptors or non-functioning insulin receptors. So it's generally less severe than the type one version and can be treated with medication and diet control. Now gestational diabetes mellitus occurs in a small percentage of pregnant women due to an imbalance of hormones. Although uh, developing diabetes mellitus after their pregnancy is over can occur, women who experience gestational uh, diabetes are not guaranteed to suffer the effects of the disease after they deliver. Um, uh, one thing to note about uh, gestational diabetes is a common complication of uh, patients that have this um, is the babies, so the newborns being actually larger in size. Metabolic syndrome refers to various risk factors that ultimately lead to an increased risk of developing cardiovascular disease. Uh, metabolic syndrome is diagnosed in patients that have three or more of the following risk factors. Abdominal obesity, high triglycerides or low HDL cholesterol levels, 
hypertension, which again is high blood pressure, and hyperglycemia, which is an increase or high levels of glucose within the bloodstream. In addition to a risk of cardiovascular disease, patients with metabolic syndrome also have an increased risk of arthritis, stroke, and type 2 diabetes mellitus. So ketones are produced from the breakdown of lipids, which are also called fat. Um, and this happens when glucose cannot be broken down as a source of energy for the body. In type 1 diabetes mellitus and in carbohydrate deprivation, like in the keto diet, uh, ketones can be present in the bloodstream and in the urine. So there are three clinically significant ketones that are important uh, to, um, to learn. So these are acetone, acetoacetic acid, and something called beta-hydroxybutyric acid, or BHB. So that will probably be the only time you'll ever hear me say beta-hydroxybutyric acid. We always call it BHB. Uh, ketones can be detected via the ACE test or ACID test, uh, which uses a nitroprusside reagent in tablet form. Um, modern chemistry analyzers uh, can run the BHB uh, via an assayed method. So we've talked um, and discussed a lot about hyperglycemia, so high levels of glucose within the bloodstream. Patients can also experience low levels of glucose within the bloodstream, and this is a condition called hypoglycemia. So hyperglycemia means too much glucose, and hypo means, uh, hypoglycemia means too little glucose. Um, so hypoglycemia can be caused by a tumor that is producing too much uh, insulin, and this is called an insulinoma. Uh, so recall that insulin is that hormone that causes cells to take up insulin, which thereby lowers the glucose levels in the bloodstream. So if this tumor is causing too much insulin, uh, that's going to cause too much glucose to be taken up into the cells. So the bloodstream levels are going to be too low. So also this can be caused by disorders within the liver and within the gastrointestinal system. Uh, patients that are experiencing hypoglycemia can be dizzy, uh, be shaky, and they can also um, even faint. So galactosemia is an inherited disorder when a patient lacks the enzyme galactose-1-phosphate ureteral transferase. And this enzyme uh, converts consumed galactose and converts it to glucose or energy. So you eat the, gal the galactose and it breaks down that galactose into glucose for you to be able to use it. So people with galactosemia can't tolerate any form of milk, you know, either human or animal, because they don't have this enzyme. So if an infant with galactosemia is given milk, um, substances made from galactose will build up in the infant system because it cannot break it down into usable glucose. So these substances uh, can damage the liver and the brain, uh, the eyes, the kidneys. Um, patients uh, that have this will also be hypoglycemic uh, because again, that ingested galactose is unable to be broken down into glucose. Um, they can, uh, patients can also have diarrhea with this and just a general failure to thrive. So the main uh, test for galactosemia is the clinitest, which I talked about a couple slides ago. So the clinitest or the Benedict's reaction or copper reduction, is, is, uh, those are all the same names for the same, uh, or I'm sorry, those are different names for the same test. All right, so we talked about glucose levels um, and assessing diabetes mellitus. There are uh, other uh, tests that uh, can be used. So once a patient is diagnosed with diabetes mellitus, uh, there are different tests that we can use to assess the patient's diabetic status. And one of these is glycated hemoglobin or glycosylated hemoglobin. Uh, you'll also probably hear it referred to as hemoglobin A1C or just an A1C. So this is a commonly used laboratory test uh, to assess a patient's diabetic control. So instead of testing a single glucose level, the hemoglobin A1C shows a physician a patient's average glucose levels for the past 8 to 12 weeks uh, from the time of draw. So hemoglobin A1C values that are greater than 6.5% indicate that a patient has diabetes mellitus and poor glucose control. Um, so actually, my, my mother is a diabetic. Um, and goes every few months to the doctor to evaluate her status. So uh, uh, apparently she's not really good at keeping her glucose levels under control on a constant basis. Um, so she's not, you know, a completely out of control diabetic patient, but she definitely needs to take better care of herself. Uh, so the day I was visiting her one time, um, the day before her blood work, um, and uh, she always eats really, really well. 
uh, the day before her blood work uh, to keep her, sh her blood sugar down uh, so that the doctor thinks she's following, you know, her diabetic diet regimen. And I always tell her this isn't going to work to trick the doctor because in addition to ordering a fasting blood glucose on her, they also order this hemoglobin A1C. And because of that, it doesn't matter what she ate the day before. That A1C is going to look at the past blood sugar uh, status over that 8 to 12 week period. So they're going to know that her blood glucose was way higher than what it should have been. So diabetics uh, patients, diabetic patients with poor glucose control can have a high risk of damaging the kidneys uh, due to the concentration of glucose output within the urine. So this is a progressive damage and it's often slow to develop. Uh, and the first sign of uh, diabetic uh, nephropathy, so a, a, an issue with the kidneys and uh, diabetes, is an increased level of urinary albumin. So a microalbumin test uh, detects these increases of albumin in the urine and is ordered usually annually to monitor patients with diabetes. So the more that's present in the urine, the more damage to the kidneys. So I've already mentioned ketones in this lecture, but we'll discuss them again here. So ketones are produced from the breakdown of lipids or fat, and, and this occurs when glucose cannot be broken down as a source of energy for the body. So in type 1 diabetes mellitus and in carbo deprivation, uh, ketones can be present in the bloodstream and urine. And again, there's three clinically significant ketones, acetone, acetoacetic acid, and BHB. Uh, so ketones can be detected via the acetest or acetest, which um, uh, uses a nitroprusside reagent in tablet form. Um, and I have a video also on my channel of me performing this test. So I will go ahead and link it below in the comments or like in the description of this video. So that way you can see it step by step how to perform this test. So modern chemistry analyzers can run the BHB uh, via an assayed method.